Bonjour, ladies and gentlemen, madame and monsieur, and welcome to Paris, home of the Croissant, Moulin Rouge, and more recently, the 2024 Olympic Games. Although the origins of the Croissant are somewhat debatable, but let's not get into that too much today. Paris, you do get around for... Per well, a, a, a person of limited Go means. Go on, a poor guy, you can say it. Now, anyway, in today's episode, we'll be exploring a bit of a French connection to the Titanic, and it involves the story of a broken down relationship and child abduction. It really is quite the story, so let's not hang about too much. Let's dive straight, straight in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Beyond the Titanic, episode 11. Or I should say, and bear with me on this one because I've been practicing it on the train over, Eau de la de Titanic, Epicadons, because that's French, apparently. Not entirely sure, because I only got a C at GCSE French. Or was it a D? Should bode well for the next couple of days. Oh, before I forget, one more thing I want to mention. Um, if you cast your mind back to around episode five when I spoke about the SS Nomadic, the tender ship to Titanic when she docked at Cherbourg up the coast here, you'll recall how I mentioned she spent a lot of her time in Paris here as a floating restaurant. And that was right here on this very spot behind me. Irrelevant for today's video, but something cool. I just thought I'd mention there. Anyway, let's get into it. She was the largest ship of her time, a technological marvel. Sending shockwaves around the globe, her maiden voyage would be her last. Just four days into her first crossing, RMS Titanic sank in the North Atlantic, taking 1,500 lives with her. These are the stories of those who witnessed firsthand one of the greatest maritime disasters in peacetime history. Scientists of a joint U.S.-French expedition said today they have found wreckage of the ocean liner whose name is a legend, the SS Titanic. Now, although I said this was a French connection, Mr. Michel Navratil, one of the people that we're looking at today, was actually born in Slovakia on August 13th of 1880. However, I didn't really have the time or budget to travel as far, and there are some French connections in this episode. Just bear with me a second. Now, Michel moved to Hungary and then in 1902 to Nice in France, see French connection, where he settled and set up a tailoring business. In 1907, he married Italian-born Marcel Caretto on May 26th. Together, the couple had two sons, Michel Jr. or Master, born in 1908, and Edmund, born in 1910. Now, please bear in mind, some of the pronunciations of these names I may not get entirely right. I am not French, and I am definitely not Italian. So if you're watching and you're from said countries and I have just completely murdered your language, I can do nothing but apologise. Now, the marriage, sadly, was a troubled one, filled with accusations of adultery on his wife's side, and by early 1912, the couple had separated. The two parents could not agree on who should have custody of the children. So whilst the courts decided, the two boys were put into care. Eventually, the courts awarded full custody to the boy's mother. The ruling completely devastated Michelle. And so he hatched a plan that would change the fate of himself and that of his two young sons. For many years, it was assumed the case of the Navratil's failed marriage was a straightforward one. Man discovers his wife having an affair, man is heartbroken, man seeks divorce and applies for custody of the children, to protect them from wicked cheating mother, the end. However, recent research has discovered that there may be a little bit more to it. Recently unearthed divorce papers indicate that his wife initiated divorce proceedings and listed at length the grounds on which she claimed. These included extreme cruelty. He made her work long unpaid hours. He had sometimes been violent towards her and in her own words had completely abandoned his wife. Upon hearing these claims, Michelle counterclaimed that he had discovered his wife had been having an affair. So we now have a case of he said, she said. It was his word against hers. So where does the truth lie exactly? The battle ended up in the courts. And it's important to note here that the state of the relationship had broken down so much that the judge felt the need to put the children into temporary care whilst the case was deliberated. 
This indicates that the judge believed that neither parent at this stage was clearly capable of caring for the children. You see, Marcel was apparently a woman who came from the quote, gutter, a woman of no substance. There was also a significant age gap between the pair. At the time of the case, she was 21, he was 31. Michel was also not in the very best of circumstance. His business was failing and he had amassed a debt of over 31,000 francs. To put that into some kind of perspective, the annual rent on his shop was 1,250 francs. Michel had also been issued with a summons to appear at a bankruptcy court on April 10th of 1912 to determine how he would pay off his debts. The stakes were high for Michel. If he was declared bankrupt, he would have little to no chance of gaining custody of his children. As previously mentioned, the judge eventually awarded full custody of the children to the boy's mother. At this point, his life had completely fallen apart. Facing bankruptcy and the prospect of losing access to his children, he decided he had to act. He convinced his now ex-wife to allow him to have the children over the Easter period, but when she went to collect them, they could not be found. Unknown to her, but Michelle had borrowed the passport of a friend to avoid detection, taken the two small boys and fled France. From France, the father with his two children in tow travelled to London where they booked into the Charing Cross Hotel. You see, he was so desperate not to be separated from his children, he hatched a plan to start a whole new life with them in America and booked passage on the first available ship he could find. After booking second class tickets on April 10th, 1912, he travelled down to Southampton where the trio boarded Titanic. To avoid detection, the three boarded under fake names of Charles Hoffman and his two sons, John and Fred. A man travelling with two young children may have aroused suspicion, and it's reported that when asked, he told his fellow passengers that his wife, Mrs Hoffman, had died. During the voyage, he supposedly never allowed his sons to leave his sight, except for one occasion when he allowed a French-speaking passenger to watch over them whilst he enjoyed a game of cards with some fellow passengers. Whilst on board, he penned a letter to his mother in Hungary, asking if his sister would be free to watch over the boys should his plan to bring the children to America fail. It was clear he had no intention of ever returning his children to their mother. On the night of the sinking, Michelle woke his children and they all made their way onto the boat deck. Like many passengers, it's likely he was completely unaware of the severity of the situation and as such either made little attempt to board an early lifeboat or was prevented from doing so. Although he was travelling with children, it's likely that he would have been prevented from entering a boat, and faced with the prospect of being separated from his children, they remained on board for the majority of the sinking. However, as the situation worsened, it probably struck home of just how serious the situation was. At 1.50am, just half an hour before the ship sank, Michel found himself in the vicinity of collapsible lifeboat D. At this point, panic amongst several passengers had set in, and the crew were forced to form a human circle around the lifeboat to ensure only women and children were permitted to board. As Michel made his way towards the shielded lifeboat, he was prevented from going any further by the circle of crewmen. However, his children were offered a place in the lifeboat. He was now faced with the dilemma that many faced that night. It was probably clear by now that the ship was going down, and it's obvious he loved his children deeply. So should he keep them by his side, or allow them into the lifeboat? Eventually, he released them from his custody, the very thing he'd tried so hard to avoid from the moment he left France. Michel Jr., who was nearly four years old at the time, later claimed that he remembered his father seeing him off in the lifeboat, and just before their final moments together, he said, when your mother comes for you, tell her that I loved her dearly, and still do. Tell her I expected her to follow us, so that we might all live happily together in the peace and freedom of the new world. So how true can this be? Remember, Michelle Jr. was only nearly four years old at the time, so can his recollection of the night really be relied upon? Eyewitness accounts are also conflicting, with some saying that in the final moments of the sinking, the half-dressed children were simply thrown into the lifeboat, 
without a word from their father. Michel Navratil did not board lifeboat D and he watched as at 2.05 a.m. it left the sinking Titanic with his children on board. It would be the last to leave the ship that night. For everyone else that remained on Titanic, including Michel, it was now every man for himself. Michel Navratil Sr. did not survive. Once in the lifeboat, the boys were fed biscuits by a fellow first-class passenger. It must have been a frightening situation to be in. The boys had been taken from their mother, their father had gone, and they were now stranded in complete darkness in the middle of the open ocean. When the rescue ship, the Carpathia, arrived the following morning, the two young survivors were hauled up the side of the ship in a canvas sack. However, once on board, they found themselves alone. They could speak no English at all and were too young to be able to identify themselves and with the absence of any parent they were soon referred to as the Titanic orphans owing to the fact that they were the only children survivors that were not immediately claimed by a parent after the disaster. Upon their arrival into New York a fellow first class French speaking passenger took the boys in and cared for them at her New York address. Back here in France the boys mother searched frantically for the whereabouts of her two young children. The sinking of the Titanic as sad as it was would have been almost irrelevant to her. She was far too busy looking for their whereabouts. It wasn't until reading newspaper reports about the two Titanic orphans that the penny finally dropped. It was bad enough that her kids had been abducted, she was now dealing with the news that they'd been taken halfway across the Atlantic and been involved in a major shipwreck. Finally, on May 16th, over a month after the sinking, she travelled to New York where she was finally reunited with her two young sons. The relief must have been immense. So what exactly is the truth here and how did it become so skewed? When Marcel went to collect her children, she was asked what she would say to them. She stated that she would tell them their father died a hero. And this is evident in how Michel Jr. recalled the night's events. According to him, his father calmly walked into their cabin, got them dressed, placed them in a lifeboat and gave them a long speech about how he loved their mother and how he intended to reunite them in America when in reality it's likely there would have been little time for such a long speech. But what reason would she have for doing this? If you ask me if my partner had stolen my kids, taken them across the Atlantic and involved them in a disaster that had nearly cost them their lives, the last thing I would be doing would be singing his praises. So is it possible that in truth and after everything she still loved him and he loved her? Either way, the boys grew up believing their father was a hero for dying on Titanic. And it's a case of either Michelle Jr.'s memories are clear and true, or they were heavily influenced by what his mother told him. Following the disaster, the two young boys grew up to live relatively ordinary lives. The younger of the two, Edmund, later married and ventured into a career as a painter and decorator. During the Second World War, he fought for the French army where he was captured and made a prisoner of war. He eventually escaped captivity, but his time in the camp had affected his health significantly, of which he never fully recovered. He died on July 7th, 1953, at the age of 43, and is buried in a small cemetery in the south of France. I did consider visiting it for this episode, but sadly it just wasn't practical as it's a small village. Much to my regret, because it looks like such a pretty little place, and we all know how much I love visiting a cemetery for these episodes. The elder sibling Michel Jr lived for much longer and despite his ordeal he would again return to the world of Titanic. In 1987 he travelled to Delaware to mark the 75th anniversary of the sinking. This was the first time he had visited the States since 1912. The following year he joined several other fellow Titanic survivors at a Titanic Historical Society convention in Boston, Massachusetts. In 1996 he again joined several other survivors on a cruise to the location of the wreck site where attempts were made to recover a large portion of the hull to the surface. From there he travelled on to pay his respects to a person he had not seen since the night of the sinking, a journey I too recently made.
Now on August 27th, 1996, Michelle Jr. arrived here in Halifax, Nova Scotia to pay his respects to the father he had left behind on board Titanic. You see, Michelle Navratil Sr. was found in the water. His body was recovered, but because of the name he had given, the fake name when he boarded Titanic, it's assumed he was Jewish. So he was brought here to this special section of the cemetery where he was buried separately to the rest of the Titanic victims. Now, for some reason, it's all locked up and I can't actually go in there, but it's beyond this fence, somewhere in there, that he was buried. Michelle Senior's bankruptcy hearing was due to take place on April 10th of 1912, but those who were paying attention will realise he never attended, for it was the very day he boarded Titanic. He was declared bankrupt on April 24th of 1912, nine days after his death. The divorce between Michelle and Marcel was never officially finalised, as Michelle was never officially declared dead. She was neither widow nor divorcee. She died sometime in 1974, still bearing the Navratil name. Her final resting place remains unknown. Michelle Navratil Jr. was one of only two survivors who lived long enough to see James Cameron's 1997 movie Titanic, and after watching it in the comfort of his own home, his daughter recalled that he was greatly moved by it. Upon watching the scene of the passengers freezing in the water, he remarked to his daughter that his only hope was that his father had not suffered for too long. He lived the remainder of his life back in France. He died on January 30th, 2001, at the age of 92. At the time of his death, he was the last remaining male survivor of the Titanic disaster. I have this feeling that it was only yesterday, so vivid it has remained. My father brought me into the lifeboat and then asked me to tell my mother how much he loved her. Hmm, not quite sure what to make of this one. It's obvious Michel Navratil loved his children and would do anything to get them back. I can understand that, but in no way do I condone child abduction. It's just as obvious it was at the end of, of his tether. He couldn't bear the thought of living without them, and in a way he got what he wanted, just not any way he could have imagined. As I was writing and recording this episode, it made me think a little bit of just how important it is to cherish what you have in your life whether it's the love of your friends or your family, because in the blink of an eye, it can all be over. And with that said, as the sun goes down here in Paris, I just want to say thank you once again for tuning in to watch this episode. I hope you found it helpful and enjoyable. And if you have, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. You can now follow me on my own personal Instagram account. So from a very lovely Paris today, that's it for this episode. As always, God bless, take care, and I shall see you on the next one. Au revoir. That's French. I can assure you on that one. <laughs>